Minister Yi, you literally worked for WTO as the di Deputy Director General. And uh, yes, and also you work as the Vice Minister of uh, China's Ministry of Commerce. So I guess you know both worlds. Would you like to share with us at the very beginning your thoughts on the issue? Please, Minister Yi. China's succession to the WTO uh, in December 2001 has proven to be one of the most significant economic events both in our lifetime and in modern world history. China's historic accession created a win-win outcome. In bringing China under its umbrella, the WTO took a huge step toward its goal of universal membership and inclusiveness. As a result of China's accession, one of the world's biggest economies now is playing by the same multilateral trade rule book as other major trading nations, particularly in terms of strengthening global trade governance and the multilateral trading system. China's successful accession has also inspired many other developing countries to join the WTO. Since 2001, both China and the world have seen trade flows rise rapidly, with China experiencing a more than sevenfold increase in the volume of its merchandise exports and a nearly sixfold increase in the volume of its imports. Meanwhile, the volume of world trade nearly doubled. China also became a leading exporter and importer of services after joining the WTO. Let me show you some data on China's imports. From $244 billion in 2001, merchandise imports into China leapt to 2.06 trillion US dollars last year. This is a significant contribution to the world economy, but which is often or too often overlooked. Since 2008, China has become the leading export destination for LDCs, absorbing about one quarter of their exports. I think that's the contribution of China to to the world economy and uh, its trading partners in the WTO. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Minister Yi, um, because it's not just the numbers, really. It's also about what these numbers mean for people. Uh, and you said it beautifully. And on those points, maybe some of your colleagues uh, who have also served in the World Trade Organization would, uh, um, you know, in a way, echo what you just said. China's accession to the WTO has undoubtedly promoted its economic growth and development thanks to more predictable trade and foreign direct investment flows, but China has been careful to adopt development strategies that work to complement external integration with strong domestic linkages. Indeed, it is the reinforcement of the internal and external integration that has helped China increase its output some fivefold in real terms since joining the WTO, becoming the world's largest manufacturer and a key hub in both global and regional value chains. That rapid economic growth has allowed China to lift millions out of poverty. At the end of 2020, China had eradicated extreme poverty based on the national poverty line and in the process significantly contributed to the global attainment of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. China's accession and subsequent success has been among the most significant events reshaping the global economy and multilateralism in the 21st century. Firstly, China has become an important engine for global growth with spillovers particularly for the developing world. Secondly, China has been a vital pillar in supporting multilateralism. 
through various international mechanisms, not just the WTO, but also the United Nations, the G20, the BRICS. China has championed multilateralism and built solidarity among developing countries, notably the Belt and Road Initiative and its recently proposed Global Development Initiative have committed China to very concrete support to international and particularly South-South cooperation. China's hosting the BRICS summit next year will be an important event in this respect. Thirdly, China's development policy experience can offer a reference point to other developing countries. Economic integration comes with risks and challenges. Since its accession, China has managed those well through targeted and adaptive policy strategies in macro finance, industrialization, trade and investment, digital and other areas. In the last three years, my team has been working on promoting experience sharing and peer learning with other developing countries. Starting from next year, we will further study China's policy experience in high quality development and explore what experience it can offer to the world, including around the growing demands of green development. We've been talking about trade. Who would know it better than guests on the stage with us who are coming from the business world? The WTO framework allows everyone to have a fair chance, especially in recent years, in the face of trade negotiations, the former U.S. administration, and the COVID pandemic. Such a framework allows us to have normal rules to stabilize international and trade relations. There were only 20,000 foreign-funded companies operating in China 20 years ago. But by September this year, there were nearly 430,000. Foreign-funded companies have not only introduced advanced technologies, but also brought global corporate business concepts and management models for their Chinese companies. In the past 20 years, Chinese enterprises have also developed rapidly and have become large international companies. So China's accession to the WTO has greatly helped both within and outside the country. Uh, One question is very crucial, and we cannot hide away from it, the challenges of reforming. What exactly are these challenges? What does it mean to our representative on the stage and on the screen joining us online? The WTO has focused a lot in the past and successfully on trade rules, tariffs, and, and the like. I think it would now be also the time to really formulate rules for data transfer, for cloud services, uh, global digital currencies, blockchains, and so on, because this is also what drives uh, the digital economy a lot. And personally, I believe the WTO can also try to achieve here multilateral rules. Um, I would probably leave it with those two points in agility and also um, adopting to the digital world because this would already help all the businesses, whether it's digital or non-digital today. But any advice about the digital world since you're in the trade? We, we have, of course, um, digital rules applying in different countries and, and they are not compatible to one another, right? So I believe a WTO probably can also help that these rules get uh, closer to one another, yeah? because different countries interpret topics like national security or, or data privacy in a different way, and we should come to agreements so that data stored here or there, that there are certain rules and standards also about how we transfer this. We are now going to have Professor Stiglitz to speak to us about the challenges of reform. As someone concerned with the developing countries and emerging markets, it is remedying the inequities in the global trading regime and the WTO, inequities that were reflected in the call for a development round. Uh, it's a long time since the Uruguay round, but those of us who remember the Uruguay round uh, remember that the demands of the advanced countries were incorporated in the results. But 
some of the key demands in the developing countries, the emerging markets, were not. That is part of what motivated the call for the development round that was uh, finally uh, brought to the table in 2001. It is a, a great disappointment that uh, more than a decade later, that ambition of trying to create a fairer WTO was abandoned. One aspect of the inequities that is very visible now uh, concerns intellectual property, the TRIPS provision of WTO. The discussion today recalls uh, the problems that were uh, very much on the table uh, almost 20 years ago in the midst uh, of the HIV uh, AIDS epidemic. The concern is that TRIPS is uh, acting as a barrier to access to life-saving vaccines. We are putting the global trade regime and the interests of the pharmaceutical companies in their profits above the lives of thousands of people. What is going on today as we discuss the COVID-19 vaccine waiver, waiver or more broadly waiver on other aspects of intellectual property related to COVID-19 is putting the very legitimacy of the WTO at stake. More than 100 countries have called for this vaccine waiver, but if just a few very powerful voices are resisting. And the result is that there has been a delay. And in the meanwhile, millions have died. How many of these lives could have been spared? We don't know. But I am convinced that it would have made a very big difference if we had taken strong action in the year ago, October, when India and South Africa had called for it. The, the issue, of course, reflects the crisis of values and of power that is at the heart of what I think is at, at, at need for reform. The compatibility of the WTO rules with, for instance, uh, climate uh, is another example of where the WTO regime will be tested. I believe that there is complete compatibility. The earlier resolution of the shrimp turtle case showed that the WTO rules could be compatible with global environmental policy. But that compatibility is almost uh, certainly going to be challenged, tested, as we address climate change and the many rules that will have to be adopted as we uh, respond to climate change. Underlying the entire agenda of reform at the WTO must be a single principle. Trade is a means to an end not an end in itself. And WTO reforms have to begin from that perspective. Uh, how significant do you see uh, China's role has been and also China's entry into the World Trade Organization for everyone? 呃，我想我们学者可以研究，国际组织可以来评估。I think scholars can look into and international organizations can evaluate the investment environment in China. But I think it is those stakeholders involved that have the biggest say. One can say whatever good things about China, but if this business deal is not beneficial to those stakeholders, they will never make a deal with China. We have repeatedly stressed in recent years the equal treatment of domestic and foreign capital, and we have cancelled some of the preferential policies for foreign investors. And this has led to some complaints. 
but it shows that we are moving in the direction of a rule-based, fair, and predictable investment environment. Even so, there are still hundreds of billions of dollars in foreign investments flowing to China and are moving towards high-end and larger-scale industries. The larger the project scale is, the longer the investment cycle required, which means investors have confidence in China and won't leave with a one-off deal. Foreign investors demonstrated with their choices exactly how well China's investment environment is doing. Uh, we also have two international participants that, that are willing to uh, share their thoughts on this. Thank you. Let me share a few thoughts on the future and the expectations. First, China should play a key role in the WTO reform. The global economic landscape has changed tremendously in the past 20 years, bringing new opportunities as well as new challenges. The multilateral trade system requires an urgent update to keep up with the business realities and address the new issues in global trade. As the world's leading trade nation, China's stake and role in the reform of the WTO cannot be overstated. An open, transparent, inclusive, non-discriminatory, multilateral trade system is crucial for the world to recover from COVID-19 pandemic and beyond as it is crucial for China's own continued growth. The 12th WTO ministerial conference is just weeks away. Positive outcomes from the WTO in areas such as response to the pandemic, fishery subsidies, agriculture and trade and development is critical for reinvigorating the WTO. It is an opportunity not to be missed. Going beyond the ministerial meeting, the WTO members need to work together on restoring a functional dispute settlement system and chart out reforms to make the agency responsive to the 21st century issues in global trade. China can and should play a key role in shaping the successful outcome of the ministerial meeting, as well as in the post-MC12 discussions. Second, China is committed to keep its market open and continuing domestic reforms. Despite the increasing uncertainties, it is heartening to see that China keeps moving forward on the reform and opening up path. We are given to understand that the government has implemented a number of reform measures in services, finance and tech sectors which are welcomed by investors and entrepreneurs. Its decision to join comprehensive and progressive agreement for trans-specific and the digital economy partnership agreement shows that the government aspires to apply the highest international standards especially in the digital economy. It is these reform measures that can help Chinese companies maintain their competitiveness in the coming decade, which is underpinned by digital and green growth strategies. And finally, ITC looks forward to continuing working closely with China to support sustainable trade development and SME competitiveness in developing countries. SMEs are the backbones of our economies and SME resilience and preparedness for future shocks should be a key consideration in post-COVID-19 plans. ITC therefore looks forward to continuing working with China in supporting SMEs to be more competitive and equipped to take advantage of the new trade opportunities and ensuring that the gains from growth are broadly shared across society. Apart from the ongoing projects, ITC is pleased to start a new partnership with Hunan Province and the China Africa Development Fund to help African SMEs promote agriculture and food exports to China. We also look forward to working together with China under the newly launched 
Global Development Initiative. I'll conclude by thanking the organizers for inviting ITC to participate in this event and thank the Ministry of Commerce for long-standing partnership and commitment to work together for global prosperity. Thank you, Minister Agawa. It's not just about WTO, really. It's also about how the world has been moving on, uh, despite all the challenges we talk about WTO. Recently, just two days ago, RCEP, for example, finally is going to come into effect uh, beginning on the very first day of 2022. Meanwhile, I understand from earlier uh, information sharing, China also joined DEPA, whom I'm sure uh, Mr. Newman would know very well about the data uh, protection and also a data sharing agreement. All of this, what does that mean? That good pressure, it seems, on WTO to move forward. And I'm only talking about China. There are many other countries among themselves are also doing some efforts as well. So I want to go to Mr. Supachai Banishpakti, earlier serving as the Director General of World Trade Organization. I'm sure uh, he could feel this good pressure, but at the same time, what it could mean for all of us together forward. The world has suffered the most traumatic economic and social devastations with the global outbreak of coronavirus pandemic since the beginning of 2020. But before this disaster struck, globalization was already going through a challenging period with a waning multilateralism and also the malfunctioning of the world trading system. Witnessing the paralysis in the WTO dispute settlement mechanism and a growing trade tension around the world. At the World Economic Forum, the annual meeting in Davos in 2017, President Xi Jinping has clearly articulated the root cause of global economic malaise to the three critical issues. One, growth of global trade, of global trade trend has been slower than GDP growth, which is already at the lowest level. Two, the problem of inadequate global economic governance. And three, the persistent problem of growing inequality to be exacerbated by the fourth industrial revolution. It is therefore most encouraging that China leadership has been keeping faith in the process of development-led globalization as embodied in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development has been put forward by the United Nations. This is all the more needed in light of the extensive setbacks of the gains in SDGs as generated by the rapid spread of the virus. Fortunately, throughout the pandemic crisis, China has kept its market open both on the import and the export side and provide early supply of the much needed vaccine. In the forthcoming WTO Ministerial Conference 12 or MC12 in Geneva towards the end of this year, China could lend strong support to development related trade issues that will be on the agenda. The WTO agreement on agreement of fisheries subsidies, for example, that has led to fishing overcapacity and damaging overfishing has been long overdue. The virus pandemic may also cause food shortages around the world and certain concession to allow low income member countries of the WTO to have public stock holding of food security inventories should be supported at the next WTO MC12. And of paramount importance, particularly to deal with the pandemic crisis, the proposal to endorse waiver from trade-related intellectual property rights or TRIPS obligations that will allow more access for developing countries to COVID vaccines 
and generate a fairer distribution. At the same time, concerns with export restrictions of medical equipment should be dealt with at the WTO MC12, this December meeting, to also unblock necessary trade in essential health products. And lastly, on a different plane, China's own effort at reinvigorating globalization through the Bell and Road Initiative. I have recently published a book in China with the title, The Bell and Road Initiative, Pathway Towards Development-Led Globalization. To make use of this global connectivity exercise as a means to recreate development-led globalization that had long been overshadowed by excessive financialization in the global marketplace. The triangular north-south, south-south trade and investment could be revitalized through this initiative, which can be accompanied by the common destiny concept to lend support to the philosophy of five Ps of people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership, which are the fundamental elements of the UN SDGs. These are some of my recommendations for China to be rallying for a global support of inclusive and sustainable globalization that President Xi Jinping has already been actively promoting around the world in the last couple of years. This immense crisis that is an existential threat to mankind's well-being could only be overcome if countries join our hands firmly once again to deal collectively with the impending health and maybe also economic calamity. Thank you. Thank you so much for your sharing of the stories and thoughts.